please rise and engage your minds and your hearts in the call to worship as we join in it together. We are here today because the weeping Mary Magdalene once said, I have seen the Lord. We are here because Jesus still comes into our locked spaces and says, peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit. We are here today like doubting Thomas who finally cried, my Lord and my God. We are here like Peter, tempted to forget the call of Jesus. I'm going fishing. We're here this morning because of Jesus, who asks us face to face, do you truly love me? We gather here to respond timidly, yes, Lord, you know that we love you. We are here as a congregation only because many faithful disciples have listened to Jesus' words. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Go and tell. Jesus has been raised. It is true. The Lord is risen. Please join me in prayer. We are here as God's people. And this is the day that you have made, Lord. We repeat our Easter shouts of surprise and joy again and again for news of your victory over the powers of death and evil is news so startling, so amazing, so different from the news that bombards us day by day. It is beyond our comprehension. You startle us again and again with resurrection life, bringing grace and hope and joy. You, in your risen power, are shaping all our days. And so we praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Together, let's lift our voices and acclaim our living Lord by singing, Christ is alive. Let Christians sing, number 206. Christ is alive, let Christians sing the cross. and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And together we say, Amen. You may be seated. The proof of God's amazing love is this. 
while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Trusting in God's faithfulness and in our resurrected Lord, let us confess our sin to God, before God, and before one another. Risen, saving Lord, we are so easily distracted and pulled in many directions by so many competing things. Worries and frustrations abound in our personal lives and in our world. In this sacred place, we name you again as Lord and bring before you all that troubles us and our sin that so easily entangles us. We confess all that pulls our focus away from you. Hear our prayers of confession before you, Lord, in your mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. People of the living God, God's mercy is wider than our sins. God's power far exceeds our limitations. And God's love wins out over all that rises against it. Together, let us affirm our faith in Jesus, who is our hope. Jesus Christ is the hope of God's world. In his death, the justice of God is established. Forgiveness of sin is proclaimed. On the day of the resurrection, the tomb was empty. His disciples saw him. Death was defeated. New life had come. God's purpose for the world was sealed. Our ascended Lord gives hope for all ages. He gives hope in the age to come. Christ is the judge, rejecting unrighteousness, isolating God's enemies to hell, blessing the new creation in Christ. In this age, the Holy Spirit is with us calling nations to follow God's path, uniting people through Christ in love. Please rise and sing of the good news of Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life.
Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace, through, we, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of our Lord Jesus be with you all, and also with you. I want to invite the kids to come forward now, and I am going to do the children's message with you. And I've got four things to, to show you, or four things to have you hear, rather. Come on up. So how are you doing this morning? Pretty good? All right. Wow, the first one is, the first thing you're going to hear comes from something that's kind of big. Um, and for the adults out there, I am not a ventriloquist, so you don't need to be craning your necks to try to see how amazing this is going to be. But the first thing is... A dragon. Okay. All right. So this is Morris. Okay. Morris, can you say hello to everyone? Well, hello. All right. So Morris, I want can, Morris. Can you tell the kids what happened to you this morning? What happened when you woke up this morning? Well, kids, let me tell you. When I woke up this morning, I decided it was a little too cold in my bedroom. And so I dove back under the sheets and hid back under them and went back to sleep. All right, kids, I have a question for you. Do you believe that Morris woke up this morning and dove back under the sheets of his bed? Well, why not? Why don't you believe it? Can somebody answer why you don't believe it? Yeah, because he's a stuffed animal. Morris isn't, isn't really anything at all. That's right. You don't believe it because Morris is a stuffed animal. Now I'm going to read, read something else to you, another story about a morning, okay? And this one, I, this one comes from a book, but I'm not going to tell you what book it is, okay? And I'm not going to tell you who's writing the book or who the book's about. So here's, here's chapter 26 of this book begins this way. Tess sat cross-legged on her bed, watching the light of the dawn fill the sky. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Do you think that really happened? No? Yeah? Do you think there really was a girl named Tess who watched the, sun, the light of the dawn fill the sky? Maybe. Uh, maybe. You don't know who the book's about or who wrote it. Is it, a, is it fiction or is it nonfiction? You have no idea. That's the right answer. You don't know whether that's true or not, do you? Now, I would like a volunteer, one of you, um, there's a lot of volunteers. I'm going to go ahead and pick you right here. Can you tell everyone what happened when you woke up this morning? Just to anything, anything that happened this morning. You were, oh. Okay. What did you have for breakfast? Did you have breakfast this morning? You had, you had cereal for breakfast. What's your name? And you wanted to go back to bed. What's your name? Elijah. So Elijah said that he had cereal for breakfast this morning and he wanted to go back to bed. Do you believe that's true? Well, why do you believe that's true? Because he said it and you trust Elijah and you believe he's telling you the truth, right? So you don't trust what Morris said because you don't believe Morris is real. You don't know if you believe what I read in this book is true because you don't know who said it or what book it is. You do trust what Elijah says. You do believe what Elijah said is true because you trust him, right? I want to read one more thing about a morning. This is from the Bible, from John chapter 20. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, do you believe that that happened? Yes. yes. And why do you believe that happened? Because it's in the Bible, and who's telling you the things that are in the Bible? You in the back in the green. Jesus' disciples? So, we, yes, it's, this is the word of John specifically. John wrote these words. But we also know that it's the word of God. That's right. So, do you trust God? Yes. Well, then you can be absolutely certain that that really happened, because God's telling you it did. All right? Okay, kids, well, you can head out to children's worship. 
or back to your families, wherever you're headed out. And uh, can you pet him? Sure, you may, you may pet him. I'll put him back in the bag, though. I wouldn't want anyone to get too distracted during the sermon by the big green and yellow dragon up front. Morris doesn't mind being stuffed into a bag, in case you're worried. Let's pray now as we prepare to hear from God's Word. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would open our ears so that we hear the Word of God this morning, your Word. We pray that you would open our hearts and work in them so that we believe and trust what we hear. We pray, God, that you would would, uh, send us out from here shaped by your word and built up in our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God's word comes to us this morning from John chapter 20, from later in that chapter uh, that I I just read the first verse of the chapter with the kids, of course, the Easter story. But uh, I want to fast forward and begin at verse 11 today, so you can grab your Bibles and find uh, John chapter 20, beginning at... um, Well, it says in the bulletin, verse 10, but I was planning to begin at verse 11. I guess I'll begin at verse 10. Why not? It's written up there, right? Um, So, and and some of you, most of you, I think, know me. I've preached here a few times, but in case um, you don't, I'm uh, Reverend Nick Monsma. I am a member of this church. I was previously the pastor at East Palmyra Christian Reformed Church, Um, and uh, Pastor Anthony is away today. I heard that last week he sprained his preaching muscles with that sermon. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, um, I'm, I'm filling in for him today so he can have a week off. Well, let's turn now to John chapter 20 and hear what God says, beginning at verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned And said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, Even so, I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold the sins from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think Thomas ought to get a lot of respect from intellectuals during the past, I'd say 200, but maybe it's more like 800 years. Uh, Thomas is a, is a good empiricist when he says in verse 25, unless I see, the mar- the hands, uh, see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and my hand into his side, I will not believe. Right, Thomas, he's a, he's a good empiricist. He's a good scientifically minded person, right? Saying, hey, unless I see it for myself, unless I can run the experiment myself and see the results in my own laboratory, I am not going to believe it. Uh, you might say that seeing is believing is, is Thomas's personal, uh, personal creed, at least here. Well, today I hope that you hear God telling you that when it comes to faith, it's not your own eyes that create faith and secure your salvation. It's rather the word of God from his own mouth entering into you that creates your faith and brings you salvation. Sometimes, you see, seeing isn't believing at all. Um, and sometimes the things we believe most, most strongly, of course, are the things we haven't seen, but other people have just told us about. But here's an example of, when, of a time when seeing isn't believing. Now, I, I remember as a young child watching this TV special on TV, and when I start describing it, I think many of you are going to remember it also. Uh, but I looked back, I looked on Wikipedia, and apparently this TV special first aired six months before I was born, so I must have been watching a rerun or something. But I remember this TV special where the magician David Copperfield made the Statue of Liberty disappear. All right, he had this audience after dark seated in some bleachers along the shore in New Jersey looking across the water to the Statue of Liberty and there were two, uh, two, two towers of scaffolding framing the Statue of Liberty there and there were spotlights shining on it and a, and a light from a helicopter sweeping back and forth hitting the Statue of Liberty and he even had, he had next to him some screen that was showing radar that had a little blip on it where the Statue of Liberty was. And then he pulled a cord and, the, and a big curtain dropped in front of the Statue of Liberty between those two towers. And then he did something else, said some dramatic words, I'm sure. And the blip on the radar disappeared and he removed the, the curtain. And sure enough, there was nothing between those two towers but empty air. And the, the spotlights were sweeping through the darkness and the helicopter was finding nothing. And the people in the audience were amazed. Some of you, I think, remember this, right? This TV special. Well, I saw this on TV. and I saw it, you know, not exactly in person, but I saw it on TV, but I don't believe any of it. And when I say that, I don't just mean I don't believe that David Copperfield actually made the Statue of Liberty disappear, but the more I think about it, the more frustrated I am because I don't believe any part of it at all. Sure, of course he didn't make the Statue of Liberty disappear, but uh, he could have faked everything. In fact, I'm I'm confident that that radar screen was just a a prop. And in fact, what's to say the audience wasn't a bunch of actors who were just pretending to be tourists? And in fact, couldn't he have filmed the whole thing in front of a green screen in some studio in Southern California? The whole thing makes me irritated the more, th- the more I think about it because I'm 100% confident that, not a, that I shouldn't believe any of it and I'm absolutely sure he didn't actually make the Statue of Liberty disappear. In this case, seeing is not believing. I'm sure that what my eyes saw did not actually happen. Well, when it comes to faith in Jesus, what Jesus says to us here is that it is not your eyes. You should not expect your eyes to create your faith and to secure your salvation, but rather the Word of God entering into you. And I hope you see that as it's revealed, as this truth is revealed in the story here of Mary Magdalene, in the story of of Thomas, and, and then finally in what Jesus said to the rest of the disciples. See, it was true for Mary Magdalene, wasn't it, that seeing was not believing. Jesus, uh, or Jesus, or Mary Magdalene is weeping outside the tomb, and Jesus comes there and, and meets her, and, uh, and, and we read that she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus, and he said to her, woman, why are you weeping? What are you seeking? 
And, and she supposed him to be the gardener. Je- Mary met Jesus. Mary Magdalene met Jesus. She saw Jesus. But for her, seeing was not believing. In fact, Mary doesn't even recognize Jesus at first. Now, there's, we can speculate plenty about why Mary did not recognize Jesus. I know it's a common assumption that Jesus in his resurrected body looked so much different than he did when he was before his death that that's why she didn't recognize him, that there was something dramatically different about him. I'm not sure that this is the best way to understand this. One of, my, one of the things I'm uncomfortable about with that explanation is that it, it's clear that Jesus looked like a person. He didn't look like some angel or glowing figure or something. He looked like a person because she thought it was the gardener. Um, and, and one of the things the Bible emphasizes in several places about the resurrection of the body is that we should be looking forward to glorified bodies that are like these bodies, but just not subject to death. And the bodies that we receive and the body that Jesus received in his resurrection was his real body, right? It was his, it was his true body. After all, his, his body was missing from, from the tomb. So I'm not sure it's, it's best to conclude that Jesus somehow had such a physical appearance that he was unrecognizable, I wonder if maybe we were supposed to understand that her inability to recognize Jesus was more something inside of her than it was something about Jesus. But in any case, we don't need to speculate on why Mary didn't recognize Jesus. Because I think what we're supposed to do is notice instead what was it that led her to finally recognize him. And it wasn't that she went and did some some investigation, looked more closely, started checking things out. No, what led her to recognize Jesus was when Jesus said to her, Mary. When he called her name. It reminds me of what Jesus had said about himself as the shepherd of the sheep in John chapter 10, where he said, the sheep listen to his voice He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Mary believed, Mary Magdalene believed, not because of what her eyes saw, but because the voice of Jesus entered her and created that faith. Jesus would say this to Thomas a little bit later. He would say, you have seen and you believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Blessed are those who believe, not because they saw and proved it to themselves, but blessed are those, Jesus says, who believe because of the word that they hear. Mary Magdalene was blessed. And I hope today you hear God telling you that when it comes to faith, and salvation. The real blessing is found not in your eyes proving something to you yourself and creating your faith somehow and securing your salvation, but rather the true blessing is when the mouth of God brings you his word and creates that faith inside of you. The truth is, of course, that we love to trust our senses, though, don't we? I mean, they are our own. They're our things, and we love to use them. We love to prove things to ourselves and try to do this all on our own. Uh, So often we want to say that it's best if I can prove something to myself, if I can see it for myself, if I can demonstrate it, if I can personally know it's true. That's best, and it's only second best if I have to rely on the word of someone else. Right? This is an assumption that we have. But Jesus turns this all upside down when when he says in those words, Have you believed, he says to to Thomas in verse 29, have you believed because you've seen me? Well, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus turns this all on its head and says, oh, sure, it's, it's true that seeing and then believing, that's natural, that's the ordinary way of things. But when it comes to faith and salvation, believing only because you've heard isn't a second best. Believing only because you've heard is supernatural. That's extraordinary. See, the truth is that as we go through life, we're given constant opportunities to question whether it really is better to see something for ourselves. 
for example, I, uh, while I am 100% confident that David Copperfield, even though I saw it on TV, did not make the Statue of Liberty disappear, I am also 100% confident that Abraham Lincoln was shot in Ford's theater, even though I, I definitely didn't see that. That happened quite a bit before I was born, of course. Um, I was as a kid, though. I did once was in, in uh, Washington, D.C., and I was at Ford's theater, and I saw that balcony where John Wilkes Booth jumped off and broke his ankle and, and so on, and the whole story. But I didn't see the, the events with my own eyes, and yet I'm 100% confident it happened. And how can this be? Well, it's because I trust the people who told me. I trust the eyewitnesses whose, whose accounts are recorded in newspapers and brought to us through historians and, and history classes and so on. I don't need to see the assassination of Abraham Lincoln by John Wilkes Booth to believe it happened because I already believe it based on the testimony. I trust the source. So let me say it to you again. Today, I hope you hear God telling you that when it comes to your faith and salvation, it's not your eyes that secure your salvation. It's the mouth of God that brings you salvation. We saw that in the case of Mary Magdalene. Now, finally, I want you to notice Thomas at the end here, and then in the middle, notice what Jesus says to his disciples. Thomas did receive the word from someone else's mouth. He received this testimony about Jesus, right? The disciples, the other disciples told him, we read in verse 25, we have seen the Lord. And it seems like at that point in the story that Thomas, that there's this, this possibility that Thomas is going to experience this heavenly blessing of being told about the resurrection of Jesus and then believing it. It seems like that, that's a possibility, but Thomas quickly shuts down that possibility and insists on doing things the ordinary way rather than the extraordinary way. He says, no, I need to see it for myself. Thomas had that opportunity to enjoy that spiritual blessing. But when he hears, he doesn't believe. He insists on seeing and believing. Okay, now look at the other disciples and the verses that come before that. They actually did see Jesus, of course. They, they saw Jesus. He, he, he appeared in the room with them and then appeared repeatedly over the course of, of those days following the resurrection before the ascension. They actually do see Jesus, and one of the things that the, that the Bible emphasizes to us is that these writings that we find here, these are, this is the testimony of those eyewitnesses. Right? God has brought us eyewitness testimony here in the Bible. That's one of the things that, that, that we're told again and again, but the fact is that these words have the power to create faith not just because they are the words of the eyewitnesses. Notice what Jesus says to those disciples who are going to go and, and, and spread their testimony about the resurrection of Jesus to the whole world. This is what Jesus says to them in verse 21. He says, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, if you declare that gospel of, of forgiveness, they are forgiven them. If you withhold, it, withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Jesus says to these disciples that their words will have power. That their will, words will have power, not so much because they saw and touched Jesus, although that is critically important. Yes, they were eyewitnesses, but their words are going to have power, Jesus says, because God the Holy Spirit has been poured out on them. So that when they speak the words of the gospel, it will be the very word of God going out and touching people's hearts. This, their eyewitness testimony, Jesus says, is not just their words. It's the word of God. And that's why it has the power to create faith and secure your salvation. For those who believe, you see, there's no difference between hearing these ancient words of Christians giving their eyewitness account and hearing the recognizable words of God himself. Let me ask you this morning, have you felt the power of these words? Have you felt the power of these words in your own life? I hope you have. 
One of the things that I am doing right now is I'm teaching a couple of history classes at East Palmyra Christian School. And two weeks ago, we were studying, with, the, with my fifth and sixth grade class, we were studying some of the Crusades from the late Middle Ages. And in, in one of the uh, accounts of the, the Crusades, uh, a couple, well, a couple of the leaders said, they were, their history records them of have, of, as having said that God spoke to them and told them that they were to lead people to Jerusalem to fight and take back Jerusalem from the Muslims. God told them to do this, is, is what history records them, them saying. And we actually spent the last 10 minutes of class then talking about what we should think when someone says, well, God spoke to me and told me such and such. And then, toward the end of that, I looked at the kids, and I, I kind of knew what the answer was going to be because I was a middle schooler once, right? And um, I have a middle schooler in my family. So I kind of knew what the answer to this was going to be, but I looked at the kids and I said, have any of you ever wished that you would he hear God speaking to you? Have any of you ever prayed and then just wished that when you finished your prayer, you would just hear the voice of God saying something in response? And sure enough, I'd say it was at least half of the kids I could see suddenly lit up with this eagerness. They're like, yeah, yeah, I've, I want that. I want to hear God talking to me. And then I said to them, what if I told you that there was a way you could for sure hear God speaking to you today? And a number of the kids seemed like they were on the edge of their seats. It was obvious that God was working in their hearts so that this was something that they knew they wanted more than even to trade the, that neat Pokemon card that some other student has or whatever the, the kids are into. I mean, this was, you could, I could tell this was something that they wanted maybe more than anything else. Yeah, oh, tell me, how could I hear God speak to me today? And I picked up my Bible and said, open up the Bible because this is God's word. And when you read these words, you're hearing the voice of God speak to you. So let me ask you this morning, have you felt the power of these words? What happens in your soul when you hear them? When you hear these words from Matthew chapter 28, He is not here, for He has risen just as He said. I hope what happens in your soul is something supernatural when you hear those words. Or what about these words from 1 John 1 verse 9? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What happens in your soul when you hear those words? I hope it is something supernatural. Or maybe these familiar words from John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I hope when you hear those words, something supernatural happens in your soul. Because blessed is the person who hears the voice of God and believes. Let's pray. God, you've spoken your word to us. So often, like Thomas, we insist that we need to see before we believe. But God, we, we pray for that supernatural blessing. Create faith in us by your word. Strengthen the faith that you've already given us by your word. And help, help us to experience that miracle again and again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to sing now number 766. Lord, we hear your word with gladness.
this morning. I'm going to uh, use Psalm 40 sort of as a backbone and structure for the congregational prayer. So if you're wondering uh, if something of, some of it sounds familiar, that may be why. I relied completely on the Lord, and he turned toward me and heard my cry for help. He lifted me out of the watery pit, out of the slimy mud. He placed my feet on a rock and gave me a secure footing. He gave me reason to sing a new song, praising our God. May many see what God has done, so that they might swear allegiance to him and trust in the Lord. How blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord and does not seek help from the proud or from liars. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in the preaching of the word, the gospel message that plants our feet firmly on the rock that you provide. We rejoice to hear your word read, to respond using your words in liturgy and songs of praise. O Lord, my God, you have accomplished many things. You have done amazing things and carried out your purposes for us. No one can thwart you. I want to declare your deeds and talk about them, but they are too numerous to recount. Lord, we rejoice in physical healing among members of our congregation, yet we continue to seek your mercy for those who still struggle with pain and infirmity. Receiving sacrifices and offerings are not your primary concern. You make that quite clear to me. You do not ask for burnt, offer, burnt sacrifices and sin offerings. You have blessed us in many ways. We rejoice that our church has weathered COVID well and are in some ways stronger as we think in, new, in terms of new ministries, new methods, and renovated spaces. Help us to see beyond our offerings of money to other ways in which we can minister to one another. Then I say, look, I come. What is written in the scroll pertains to me. I want to do what pleases you, my God. Your law dominates my thoughts. Make us hungry for your word, our daily bread, for by it we grow in faith. We often think of giving in financial terms, but are reluctant, reluctant to give of our time, even when that is what is needed for spiritual growth. Help us to hoard space in our lives for the reading and study of your word. May we make ourselves available for Sunday school classes and other programs of our church so that we, so that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I have told the great assembly about your justice. Look, I spare no words. O oh Lord, you know this is true. I have not failed to tell about your justice. I spoke about your reliability and deliverance. I have not neglected to tell the great assembly about your loyal love and faithfulness. We cry to you for justice in our world, that tyrants and oppressors would be brought low. We pray for the peace and prosperity of the land in which the church finds itself. The lawmakers would be mindful of the poor, oppressed, and sick. May we encourage each other with the good news while it is still called today, using psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. O Lord, you do not withhold your compassion from me. May your loyal love and faithfulness continually protect me. For innumer innumerable dangers surround me. My sins overtake me, so I am unable to see. They outnumber the hairs of my head, so my strength fails me. Please be willing, O Lord, to rescue me. O Lord, hurry and help me. May those who try to snatch away my life be totally embarrassed and ashamed. May those who want to harm me be turned back and ashamed. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be humiliated and disgraced. Increase our faith. You are our only comfort in life and in death, yet we are not immune to fears of displacement or in injury. 
As we grow in faith, we grow secure only as we trust in you. Open our eyes to recognize that many around us, the many around us in situations much more precarious than our own. We thank you for the Flower City Work Camp Youth, for the opportunity to engage in helping others, but also to realize that many struggle on a daily basis for basics we take for granted. Restrain those who would cause chaos and who prey on others. May we push down our own fear so that we might continue to offer the cup of cold water. Give us patience and vision as you discipline and shape us, as you give us opportunity to serve one another, as we trust that you are in control, even as we seek to understand the difficult situations in which we find ourselves can bring glory to your name. May all those who seek you be happy and rejoice in you. May those who love to experience your deliverance say continually, may the Lord be praised. I am oppressed and needy. May the Lord pay attention to me. You are my helper, my deliverer. Oh my God, do not delay. Amen. The offertory scripture is from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. You may say to yourself, my power and my strength in my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember, the Lord your God, for he is the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Let us pray. All things have their origin with you, O Lord, and from these riches we freely give that your church might grow in this place and throughout the world. Amen. The special cause offering for today is for Christian Education Society, and next week's will be for the Deacon's Fund. And now, Trevor and Mary will share a ministry report from Flower City Work Camp. So we uh, hear from the work sites every year. So the team thought that this year, I'd give you an inside look into one of our sort of backstage operations, the kitchen crew. So I get in my kitchen crew uniform here. The kitchen serves, or this year served, 400 to 500 teens and adults from 29 different churches. Breakfast is a very fast 30-minute rolling shift from 6.30 to 7, and then from 7 to 7.30. Dinner is more of a rolling service with work teams arriving in batches when they finish up on their work site and then come back to eat dinner whenever they manage to do that. And the dinner service continues until all of the teams come in. Prep team for Flower City starts before even Flower City begins, when we have a few people who come in the day before Flower City to unload the trucks with all the food, stow it away, set up the kitchen and the dining room, and get ready for us to start. Each day, the 13 volunteers for the breakfast crew arrive at 4.30 to 5 a.m. to begin working. Top priority, to get the 200 cup coffee makers going. No hot coffee, major crisis. The other crisis we discovered with the first breakfast service was the lack of ketchup. It seems that ketchup is an important ingredient for eggs, something I did not know. We subbed in hot sauce from the previous night's taco service and that seemed to serve its purpose. We have two small crews that stay after breakfast for several hours to begin the prep of food for dinner. 
and then they begin setting up for dinner service. The final breakfast service is on Friday morning, and every leftover from the entire week, dinner and breakfast, is put out for breakfast. It is not unusual to see a teenage boy with a plate piled high with taco chips, fried chicken, scrambled eggs, waffles, ice cream to top, hot sauce on top of that. The adults in the room tend to just cringe. This year, year my co-leader and I would say that the theme for serving was God provided. In February, we still did not have a chef, and we were panicking. Our chef, Bob Anderson, was a gift. He was knowledgeable, skilled, calm. He had a good sense of humor when we had a freezer fail sh shortly before camp began, losing all of our meat. Bob was unfazed. Within days, he managed to get all of the beef, chicken, and 1,000 meatballs donated, saving our kitchen budget. His main assistant in the kitchen was a man we began to call Angel Michael. He quietly moved through the chaos, doing every job that appeared before him. We learned later that his son had quite recently died and that he and his wife were now caring for their teenage granddaughter. When Michael was unable to finish out the week, God provided. We had our own David Dill who had already proved to be invaluable in the kitchen all week and now simply stepped into Michael's role as, role as sous chef. When Pete Vigna, our man of all work, was unable to return to do his usual run to the open door mission with all of the food that is left over, God provided. One of our three volunteers who remained to help clean up and pack up suddenly informed us he had a pickup truck and the other volunteer had a SUV. The entire open door mission food was packed into these two vehicles and driven to the open door mission. God provided. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. It was a pleasure for me to be on. Um, I did basketball camp this year with Flower City Work Camp. Um, and this year being my senior year, it was kind of a blast, um, having the, the home based location move from, um, traditionally Browncroft church, um, to Bethel church. So it was kind of new and I liked it. Um, one, I have a couple stories of how I saw God moving in people's lives. Um, and so one thing was, so during the day we go to this independent organization um called youth for christ and it's uh it's located on um favor street kind of by um nick tahoe's and that kind of area um so we go there during the day and we play basketball with the kids and so anyway one of the the second day one of the kids his name is marcus he's um about my age or maybe even a year older and he's like really, really good at basketball. Um, he was going have to go to Virginia on Thursday to, I believe it was something to do with a prep school. Um, but so we weren't expecting him to show up on the last day of camp. But then at the last minute on Thursday morning, um, he showed up and we were all surprised. And he decided that he was going to... Um, go to Virginia a day later um, because he felt that he wanted to stay and um, play with the team here. So I think that God really um, influenced his decision. And the other thing, the other um, way I saw God moving this, um, this past week at Flower City was one of our team members, her name is Gabby. She was playing basketball and fell in a bad way and her kneecap actually like dislocated slid out of place so we didn't think she was ever gonna well we didn't think she was gonna be able to obviously get up and play basketball we got the paramedics in um and they had to you know move it back into place and normally that's a really painful procedure um but thanks to god like it actually wasn't too painful for her and she was actually able to come back to camp the next day and 
Um, her mom said she had to use crutches, but she didn't anyway. She was walking. So, yeah, I think God was moving in that as well. Thank you. Please stand and join me to celebrate uh, the word shared and ministry shared with 191. Praise the Savior now and ever. Praise the Savior. Now God sends you out from here to live in the faith that he has created in your hearts by his word and by his spirit, and he sends you out with this blessing, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
Thank you for being with us this morning. We hope you were blessed by this time of worship and praise, and we hope you'll join us again. If you'd like to learn more about Rochester Christian Reformed Church, visit our website at rochestercrc.org. We'd love to get to know you. Thank you again, and may God bless you this week.